I'm Doug DeVries, and I uh, am in a practice in uh, Sparks, Nevada, and it is a referral center. Uh, but the unique aspect about this referral center is also have a dedicated dry eye clinic. And today, going to be talking uh, about osmolarity and kind of go de into depth of why osmolarity, who might it affect, uh, why we might be interested in that. And I'm really privileged to be joined by one of my favorite doctors, and she is just a noted expert in ocular surface, and that's uh, Dr. Leslie O'Dell. Leslie, uh, welcome, and uh, tell the audience a little bit about your practice. Well, always great to join in a conversation about dry eye with you, Doug, so thank you for having me. Um, I am in in a medical optometric practice now. So we are um, Medical Optometry America and I'm in uh, Pennsylvania. And so we're sort of the in-between between, between um, the refractive optometrist that's focusing on glasses and contacts and the surgeons the surgeons and practices like yours that are integrated. So we're, we're kind of like the middleman taking care of a lot of chronic ocular disease, which obviously includes ocular surface disease and dry eye. And I know you're very passionate about dry eye and you really treat very aggressively. Uh, let's talk about osmolarity and how you feel about osmolarity, how long you've been involved with osmolarity and what really drew you to that, that science. So, you know, I may not go back in dry eye as long as you, but I do feel like I've been dedicated to dry eye for the past 20 years. So, you know, I know that you were at this a little bit before me, but I remember early on reading about osmolarity and um, just how there was going to be a marker that we could easily detect in the office that would give us a, a tier volume for our patients. And so the practice I was working in in the early 2000s wasn't quite yet buying in on the science. Um, so at, at the beginning, all I had access to was reading about it through, you know, documents like the TFAS dues uh, original report and lots and lots of trade publications. It wasn't until 2015 where I went into a private optometric practice opening a dry eye focus center that I could really um, jump in feet first to osmolarity. And that's where I first started to use it in my clinic. And now, you know, fast forward another five to six years, I really don't know how I would do dry eye management without osmolarity. Isn't that the truth? Because really it's, it's part of the definition, you know, loss of homeostasis an increase in osmolarity, inflammation and neurosensory abnormality. So it's actually part of the de whole definition of dry eye that a uh, whole lot of expert in, in the uh, dry eye workshop came up with. Uh, so really in the United States, so what we're talking about is really Trucara. And Trucara, who has the Scout Pro, uh, really has gone through some recent innovations in terms of the technology. Uh, what are your thoughts about partnering with Trucara? Well, it's been really quite seamless for us to switch from uh, tier lab and our, you know, original system to Scout Pro. And I can tell you that it's made me the favorite clinician um, for all of my technicians that because it's made their job a whole lot easier. So I would say if anything, it was uh, one of the more easy inner, inner um, integrations of technology that I've seen um, in my practice over the years. And I think it's a real important aspect that, I mean, you mentioned something key and it has made the technician's life easier. Uh, kind of a differentiation of how it's made their life easier compared to how we used to measure uh, osmolarity with TearLab. Could you explain that? So the portable nature of Scout Pro is very nice. In my practice, we have one per technician. So we have um, three units that we each tech kind of starts their day with their Scout Pro in their in their pack pocket, or if they're working in a certain exam lane, they have it right there, you know, at their fingertips. So it's really helped um, reduce some stress and strain of a backlog that I would have from patients moving from the waiting room to my pre-test room before they would hit the exam room. So now I can do point of care testing with osmolarity in the exam lane versus, you know, in my pre-test room that might be occupied by somebody else that is in need of some of the equipment I have in there. 
And then the feedback I've gotten from my technicians is just the ease of use. They're able to gather the tear sample a lot easier and they can process the tears much quicker. So they're getting a number all on that handheld unit versus having to dock and wait for the numbers to appear. So for just like streamline ease, they're loving it for those reasons. And there may be doctors listening that have have used Tear Lab in the past and, and looked at osmolarity. There may be individual practices are really looking of why should I incorporate this into my practice? What type of practice would really look at something like this? I know in my practice, which is a, a busy surgical practice, uh, having the Scout Pro has, has avoided a lot of collisions in the hallway from technicians taking the measurements and running back to the docking station to try to get that measurement. So the efficiency unquestionably uh, is really important. Uh, and the technicians, anytime you can make their job more efficient, well, let's talk about the practicality of, you know, what patients and, and where would you see this fitting in as counseling on pre-surgical uh, patients or perhaps uh, patients. And I, I think what really pertains to so many optometrists out there uh, is that they have busy contact lens patients and how you see that would actually fit in with the concept of osmolarity, since we know we can gather it efficiently now, but how does the whole concept of osmolarity fit into those type of practices? Well, I will kind of walk you through my thinking around how I incorporated it in the practice I'm in currently, and then and I will um, kind of talk you through my idea with surgery and then definitely hit on contact lenses because I still think there's a lot of missed dry eye in those contact lens wearing patients, um, especially contact lens wearing patients that might be experiencing end of the day symptoms or even, um, you know, dropping out for reasons because of ocular discomfort. But what I did, which I'm really excited that I finally was able to implement because again, I've been reading about other people doing things this way for many years, um, is I utilize a questionnaire for actually the majority of my patients, whether they're there for a dry eye exam that day or um, their annual exam, a glaucoma exam, they have diabetes, you know, all of these different disease states. They start in the waiting room with my um, questionnaire, which is the speed questionnaire. So that helps me to identify people who are having any kind of ocular symptoms relating to ocular surface disease. From there, we've been able to just have a standing order in our clinic that allows for my technician to order point of care testing with um, osmolarity. And then we're also implementing um, MMP9 testing as well. So all that testing is done for me. Um, plus I have a symptom survey before I'm even entering into the room with these patients. So when I think about, you know, the diabetic patient or the glaucoma patient, those might be patients that we have a big opportunity to miss if we don't try this proactive approach. Those sometimes are the patients that you finish your exam and they say, hey, doc, by the way, my eye feels sandy and gritty all day, you know, right when you're ready to be finished with the exam. This way I know, okay, the osmolarity is elevated. They, they may or may not have elevated MMP9 levels. They have symptoms. I know I want to do a stain, you know, evaluation of them, maybe different than I would traditionally for a glaucoma patient that day, um, so that I can start that conversation around ocular surface disease. So those are kind of my everyday patients, and it's it's been working wonder, you know, wonders. And for anybody that is, you know, in the, the business of eyes, you know, we, yes, we want to take the best care of our patients, but we also are, you know, in business um, that we have to, you know, see patients to be in business. And so it's been a pleasant surprise by implementing this, my return rates. So I have about 46 to 50% of my return visits coming from an ocular surface cause. So oftentimes doctors say, well, we don't have time for this technology or we don't have time to add one more thing. And my argument really is, how do you have time to miss dry eye? Not only are you doing best to the patient, but it's a, a nice practice builder for you. You know, another reason for a patient to visit the office and hey, guess what? You're gonna make them feel better in their eyes. <laughs> they're they're gonna love you for that, right? 
Um, surgery is where I started my interest in dry eye. And I would love to hear your ideas on what I think about this. So I've kind of taken the ASCRS guidelines that are given to practices like yours. And I've been doing this pre-surgical evaluation for dry eye in my practice before I send them out the door. And the reason is when I worked for the surgeon many years ago, if we had that ocular surface patient unidentified, it was really hard to change the course of their next few visits, right? So I always say it's kind of like a moving train. When you get in the cataract consult, you're kind of like a moving train. You don't want to slow the process down, whether it's because of ocular surface or measurements that need to be repeated, you know, or a health condition that pops in. It's hard because it not only affects your consult day, but it affects your surgery day and all the visits after. So I used to feel kind of like, why are we pushing through surgery on some of these patients? But now that I'm on the other side, I think if we're referring patients to practices like yours, you know, we, the optometrists, need to do a better job of preparing the eye before we're ever sending them out. Uh, you know, and I love sitting down and talking with you, Leslie, because, uh, you know, your concepts and the way you actually put that into practice and make this work is so, so effective. The questionnaire, I completely agree. That's low hanging fruit because the patients are saying, I have a problem. But then you included patients with diabetes, patients with glaucoma, patients that have been fit in contact lens. When you take just those three three groups, you're not talking about the extraordinary, you're talking about the ordinary, and they're well over 50% of your patient population will have, in that group, will have a dry eye problem, whether they have identified it or not. So I think when you're, you're inclusive of looking at those patient groups, looking at that questionnaire, you're going to cast a much, much larger net to kind of catch those individuals. And I think that's so important. Uh, the other uh, point you made is on these pre-surgical patients, when we talk about, you know, what do we do to be able to capture those patients who may have a dry eye problem? Well, the Bill Trattler data uh, that he, the study where he took a look at uh, well over 150 patients, looking at the percentage of patients that had dry just upon re being referred in, it was 81% of those patients had level two, three, or four dry eye just upon presentation into that surgical practice. So when you're categorizing these, it's absolutely, uh, you know, what I find very, very fruitful in finding those patients and be able to identify them. And we've been squeezed so bad in opt opt optometric practices uh, as of late with the pandemic and outsourcing a lot of contact lenses as well as eyewear that really when you you mentioned, hey, we're, we are in a business and we have to keep that business going. So you really have a choice and the choice is twofold. You can either see more patients or you can do more for your patients that you see. And what I hear you saying is, let's elevate that level of care, let's do more for that patient, and then that's gonna positively affect the, the uh, revenue stream as well. One thing that I you know, like to talk to doctors about when I'm introducing the idea of osmolarity is, you know, when you tell me hyperosmolarity is the reason why you start seeing surface breakdown or inflammation, it's causing the, the staining patterns that you're seeing, and you have a measure that I can do very easily. And you know, when the doctors choose not to, I, I say, how can you look at the optic nerve and guess the patient's eye pressure? You know, you can't guess that without having a metric. And so I think that with dry eye, there's just, I mean, we've come a whole, you know, we've come very far in this past two decades. Um, I think um, patients or doctors rather are becoming much more proactive in their approach. I was talking to a, a colleague um, over the past week and they said, sometimes I have patients that don't know they have dry eye. I'm telling them they do. And I think like, wow, that is so refreshing because that's, you know, that is the future. If we can stay proactive, these patients don't have to end up with more advanced disease um, states. At least, you know, that would be the hope. A patient um, just said to me the other day, you know, you know, well, I don't feel bad. Why would I treat it? Right. So she was, you know, hyperosmolarity. She had surface staining, which she wasn't feeling. But of course, that's a different concern. <laughs> um, and I said to her, 
what if I told you you had high blood pressure? Would you want to be treated or not? And she's like, absolutely, I'd want to be treated. And I said, well, it's the same thing. You know, you might not feel bad with your eyes today, but in the future, you will. It's a chronic progressive disease. And so this is why we're going to take this proactive approach now, because I want you to feel comfortable not knowing you have eyes, you know, for as long as we can. So I think sometimes you just you, the doctor, have to remember that you are the doctor and you're there to provide, you know, advice, even if it is in a proactive nature versus just always the reactive. Well, and tell me how osmolarity fits in as you're treating a patient and you're following a patient. How does that fit in uh, to your treatment protocols? <clears throat> So we are doing this all, you know, all the time, especially again, well, my dry eye patients, every visit. And the only thing I wish existed, and maybe it does, and I just don't know, would be an EHR that could show me a nice graph of osmolarity over time. Because that's one of the things I think with, we don't have like good dry eye modules for tracking things, but we record it and look at, you know, look over it every visit. But patients are used to having lab work done. They're used to seeing that, you know, their continuum of certain things, you know, um, whether it's their vitamin D or their lipid levels or whatever it is. So for me, I always say we're looking at the chemistry of your tears and here's where we were, here's where you are. Um, and sometimes that might not always be a perfect downhill slope. Um, sometimes you might have some imbalance between the eyes or maybe you have a flare up and they actually go from being, you know, relatively normal osmolarity to now hyper osmolarity. All of that is, you know, just a way to have a conversation with the patient to see what's going on in their day to day, what might have changed in the environment that they're in. You know, this the, in the summertime, I'm always thinking about airflow with air conditioners. In the wintertime, I'm always thinking about dry heat and different things. But I feel like sometimes it's frustrating to see the number vary, but it usually, as you're on a treatment path, is consistently coming down and normalizing. And it's so exciting when you get that patient into normal osmolarity range and can show them that. Uh, and it, it's a journey, right? So it also helps to, to encourage them along the way, especially if you, you know, if you know you're not able to treat everything with, you know, one magic bullet on one visit, which we definitely know is the case. I love that uh, expression that you use it is a journey because it absolutely is a journey. And one of the things that I found in being involved in osmolarity from the very beginning was that patients really like the metric. Patients like to have a number. I mean, what's the first thing a glaucoma patient asks you when you pull the tonometer tip away? What's my pressure? And I found in the early stages where we had to charge a patient, there was no insurance coverage. There was no CPT code that we would charge that patient and explain what we were doing. And they would come back knowing they were going to have to pay and said, are we going to go over that number again? Are we going to test that again? And so you really see that a patient likes that along their journey to find out. And to me, it really is as part of the treatment. Like you say, there may be a downward trend that occurs and the, and the delta between the two eyes becomes closer. We love to see that. But when it's not, we start asking questions and we say something else has changed. Are you currently using your treatment? Are you, you know, you find out, is there compliance? Is something else changed? Are they now doing a lot more computer work? I mean, but it spawns questions that you can ask that question. So I find it along that patient journey so, so valuable to have to be as a tool. And I love the way you triangulate also with MMP9s to be able to show that. I think any of the information, how difficult is it to get a CLIA waiver? What kind of what did you go through in, in obtaining the CLIA waiver so that you could do point of care tests? Well, the CLIA waiver is actually not that complicated or expensive. Um, it is a simple application that you have to, you know, fill out and um, get your license. And then you do have to operate like a lab, which basically just means you have a binder that says this is your protocol of how things are run. Um, and there's a, I think it's an annual fee that it, I don't think it's every two years. I think it renews every year. But I mean, I think it's, you know, $100 or 
right around that amount. So it's not that you're investing a lot every year in a CLIA waiver. If you are a multi-center practice though, you do need one per location. So that's the only time that sometimes it might add up a little bit, but we're still talking, you know, a couple hundred dollars to do this. Um, and so really, I don't see that as a barrier. Um, I, I see that as a, you know, a, I guess for doctors that are looking at it, that's going to be one of the barriers, right? If I don't have a CLIA waiver, how do I get it? But the good news is optometrists can get it in most states um, and it's easy to do. So it's a pretty low hurdle to accomplish and yeah. doing that. Yeah, I, I would say that. And I think it's important for doctors who are considering adding point of care tests and adding osmolarity to their point to realize that they bill that as a lab test. It does not affect any other CPT code they build. It doesn't affect any ENM code they build. It is strictly as a lab test. And that falls under a completely separate deductible. And so when we actually look at the financial side of that, there is a return on that. And even though, you know, you may look and say Medicare may be somewhere in the 20 to $24 range per eye, when you're doing that, that actually can amount to a, to a difference on your bottom line over time. Not the reason to do it, because like what you said, so was so important. And you talked about how many of your visits and your return visits are related to ocular surface. And this is one of those things that continues to bring patients back because you've identified it and you bring those patients back. So it's absolutely not just the revenue generated from the point of care test, it's what you're going to do downstream with the patient. It's the visits you're gonna have, the other procedures you're gonna do in attempting to lower that patient's osmolarity. So I know you've adopted the, the Scout Pro within your, uh, within your practice. Uh, what advice can you give to doctors who are maybe just considering this and say, you know, I haven't quite made that move yet, but I'm considering putting in point of care testing, specifically osmolarity. What, what type of advice would you give them? Well, I would say if you are dedicated to dry eye disease, which, you know, with the millions of Americans that are living with the problem and, you know, vision being one of the top reasons why people complain about dry eyes. So fluctuating vision might be bringing those patients into all of our offices. The, the question is really just when, you know, when can your office support something like this? And sometimes if I think about private optometry practices, especially, they're not as heavy tech, you know, driven. A doctor is doing a lot of that testing versus if you're working in an integrated practice, you may have more support from techs. But there's always a person you know, in every office I've worked in, whatever modality it is that does pre-testing, right? They're checking vision, reading glasses, um, and doing maybe an auto refraction and whatever way that you measure eye pressure that's not applanation. And that person is very easy to train, um, you know, using something like Scout Pro. So the barrier won't even be on your staff. I think it's really just understanding, you know, understanding where we've come in dry eye. Again, knowing that we have this metric that is hallmark of diagnosing the disease. You know, in the the latest TFOS Dues Two report, diagnosing dry eye um, question there. So your patient has symptoms, and then one test, one of which is tear film osmolarity. Other tests you're going to do anyway with uh, tear breakup time or staining patterns, but that number is so important. And, it, you know, it's it's always surprising to me sometimes how high it is on certain eyes and when I expect them not to be. And those would have been patients that I would have totally missed, you know, much like people argued about MMP9s, like, well, if your eyes inflamed, I'm going to see it because it's going to be red. Well, actually, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not always going to be red, right? Plenty of eyes are white and healthy looking and have really high levels of MMP9. So I would just say these are metrics, you know, osmolarity is a metric you can't see when you're doing your exam and you need a device to help you see that. Um, and then that's going to help you with your evaluation, it's gonna save you time in clinic. And more importantly, it's gonna give your patients better vision um, and more comfortable eyes, which um, they will applaud you for. And you mentioned uh, patients or practices 
that are dedicated or interested in ocular surface disease. But let's talk about another practice that maybe wants to become involved and how that fits into, and I know how you feel about this, but if you'd share with the audience how this, how the contact lens patient and the contact lens practice fits into being able to measure a patient's osmolarity for the health of their eyes in the continuation of the of the contact lens, where if you wouldn't mind sharing that. Well, and we didn't get to that earlier. So I would definitely like to talk about that. Contact lens, you know, wearing patients um, oftentimes aren't telling the doctor that they feel bad in their lenses um, because they don't want you to take them out of their lenses, right? We've been hearing this a long time. So doctors have become inventive of the way they ask about uh, contact lens comfort, right? They might not say, are you happy in your contacts? Because they might just know the patient's going to say yes. So osmolarity becomes an objective measure for that patient that you can kind of see, okay, is the contact lens being supported by a healthy tear film? Because if it's not, before I start making a lot of changes to brands, materials, cleaners, solutions, you know, all of these things, or lose the patient altogether, I can see that the reason for some of the patients with contact lens intolerance is poor tear film, poor tear film stability, you know, low tear volume. I can identify it. I can show them that metric like you were talking about. So it makes sense to them, show them normal and where they fall, and then start having the conversation about, well, yes, I want you to be a healthy contact lens wearer. And you know what, maybe we can even keep you in this contact lens that you're happy with, but we can make your eye happier in the lens, right? We can give you a healthier tear film to support your contact. So with your screen use or your long work days, you feel good. And you know, uh, if I'm a patient and I'm hearing you as a doctor, what you're telling me is I'm going to monitor that health. I'm going to monitor the health of the tears so that I can keep you in those contact lenses longer and I can make appropriate changes. And to me, that just exudes confidence uh, in your doctor uh, as a patient to say, okay, I have somebody looking out for me, not just being reactive when I can't wear the contact lenses. So yeah, I really, uh, and I, I've known your feelings on that. And that's why I asked you that question. But, uh, you know, I want to thank you for joining me today. I think you've given, uh, given doctors considering osmolarity or perhaps that have been using osmolarity, certainly good reasons to keep and maintain and be able to provide that uh, that point of care test for patients. But uh, thanks so much for uh, for joining me today, Leslie. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Always a pleasure. Thanks so much.